Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Vegan Mainstream Cookbook Club. We are excited to have you here, and we're also excited to have our guest tonight, where we're going to be talking about not just eating vegan, but really talking about some ways we can make sure that we keep it healthy um, and also keep it fun. So I think we're going to have a lot of fun tonight talking about um, cooking styles in ways that we can all, especially as we roll into these holidays and roll into the new year, just making sure that we're keeping that healthy hat on as we're thinking about um, you know, improving our vegan diets or anyone out there that's maybe new to veganism. So I'm excited to have you guys here. Let's talk a little bit about logistics if you're joining us for the first time. This will be recorded so you'll be able to watch it and share it hopefully with any of your friends. But more importantly, we'd love to get your questions. If you have any questions um, for our guests tonight, please feel free to post them on Twitter, Facebook, Google+, no matter where you're watching. We will try to grab those up and pass those along to our um, to um, Chef Dell, who's going to be speaking and talking with us tonight. We'd love to make this interactive. If you do watch this session recorded, still post your questions because... Um, our guests will be with us all week, so we'll be able to um, hopefully get you some answers and also, as always, really make this fun and make sure that we're really getting inspiring and getting everyone into the kitchen and getting you guys cooking and not just observing and looking at the pretty pictures, but really making some delicious meals this week. Okay? So with that, I'm going to introduce Emma, our blog manager, and she's going to tell you all about our amazing guest tonight. Hi everybody, welcome back to the Vegan Mainstream Cookbook Club. Glad you can be with us again this week. I am so excited to introduce our guest chef this week, Chef Del Srof. Uh, Del is the author of the well-known, very well-known, I have it in my my cookbook, uh, on my cookbook shelf, uh, the New York Times bestseller Forks Over Knives cookbook. Um, he also has most recently written a cookbook called Better Than Vegan, and that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, in Better Than Vegan, um, Chef Dell provides more than 100 recipes that talk, that talk about how veganism can be not only delicious, but also super, super healthy for you. So um, we're going to hear a little bit more about Dell's story shortly, um, and I would like to send you a big welcome. Well, I'm so glad you could be with us tonight, Dell. Thank you. It's exciting to be with you. This is fun for me. <laughs> well, we I, I want to get started. We always get started with these chats by asking our guests to tell us a little bit about themselves and their own veg story. So could you do that for us, please? <laughs> You know, my uh, my story is about 24 years old in vegetarianism. I dropped out of college in 1989 and went to work for a vegetarian restaurant. Not because I was going vegetarian at the time, but because I wanted to get some management experience, and they offered me a job as an assistant manager at night. Uh, as it turns out, I was there eight and a half years and did become not only vegetarian but vegan, uh, helped the restaurant turn more from vegetarian emphasis to a vegan emphasis and then by the time I left in 1997 um, I had started uh, doing a lot of vegan baked goods so I opened a vegan bakery um, in a neighborhood with a food co-op in, in the same building. So in 1997 I opened a vegan bakery and spent four years building and growing that business and um, um, I did what I know a lot of people do but we don't hear too much about was I, I chose the wrong vegan foods to to fuel my body and as a result gained over 200 pounds um, and uh, became a, a very unhealthy unhappy chef so I closed the bakery in 2001 started a personal chef service and uh, over the next five years um, really started feeling the effects of my um, excess weight and unhealthfulness and uh, in 2005, 2006 I fell, I actually fell and broke a bone in my foot that never healed and of course it wouldn't heal because I weighed over 475 pounds at the time and um, I spent a lot of time just sort of managing pain and managing fatigue until finally I went to the Wellness Forum, it's the company that I work for now uh, the Wellness Forum teaches people how to take control of their health 
um, using diet and lifestyle change and using a primarily plant-based diet, but a different plant-based diet than the one that caused me to gain all the weight. So I went on our program and learned how to eat differently and then started losing the weight and have been um, successfully losing the weight and regaining my health ever since. I've lost over 200 pounds and I'm working on uh, the remaining pounds and not only that, but working on gaining what we call optimal health using a whole foods, low-fat, plant-based diet. So that's that's my story in a nutshell. <laughs> that's inspiring, and I think a lot of oh, that's something that we talk about quite a bit here on the Vegan Mainstream Cookbook Club and on Vegan Mainstream in general. That that um, you know there are lots of ways to be an unhealthy vegan. It just being vegan isn't the ticket to good health. You can you you definitely still have to make good choices. So we're excited to to have you here to share that perspective. Well, thanks. I, I think what you've seen, especially in the past maybe 15 years since I've I first went vegan, is that the vegan food market almost parallels the mainstream food market. So you have vegan sausage, you have the processed cereals, you have sugar, white flour, lots of excess fats and oils, and processed foods that um, are very attractive and taste very good and makes people feel like they're not giving up so much when they eat these foods and I think it's a big part of the problem that we're seeing in the vegan diet. I, I really agree and I, I think that's, um, that's a huge a huge issue with the what people call the transition foods, right? But it's easy to get hooked right. on having, you know, oh, vegan sausages and whatever for dinner. And it, yeah, it is similar to what you're eating before, maybe. But then you're not gaining the health. And there are other reasons to go vegan for sure. And so um, that that's a, a positive um, move. But still, if you're doing it for health reasons, and why not take advantage of, like you said, the optimum health benefits of of a truly truly healthy vegan diet well yeah the healthy vegan diet is is the healthiest diet on the planet and we have plenty of statistics and plenty of populations who eat this way that show us that it's it's true mm -hmm. so what we have to do is sort of catch up to ourselves i think catch yeah. up to our ideal if you will but what do you think is the biggest barrier what do you think people are struggling with i mean is it just you know taste is it just history of you know, I've always eaten this way, so, you know, and I'm struggling. Yeah, with I, 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 think, I think all the unhealthy foods that we talk about are, are very addictive. Um, and, and if you think about it, human survival has depended upon that, that kind of addiction for millennia. And in other words, eating calorically dense foods has what's kept us alive in times of scarcity. All right, so it, it means that when we eat sugar, there's a, a, a dopamine receptor or whatever kind of receptor that goes off that says, okay, this is good, this is going to help me survive. Uh, and fatty foods are the same and high-protein foods are the same kind of thing. So there's an addictive mechanism. So it's, it's kind of, in a sense, not our fault. Mm -hmm. But the problem is that we've, we've, we've taken that and taken it to the extreme with some of these unhealthy foods. So I think that's one of the big problems that we see. Another one, again, I think it's food marketing. Um, when we're seeing the same processed foods that we were just talking about being thrown at us um, and saying, okay, you don't really have to give up sausage. <laughs> you know, Here's vegan sausage that tastes just like what you've had and what you're used to. You can have uh, mac and cheese and you can have cakes and cookies and donuts and ice cream and pie and all of those foods that we knew. So people assume that going vegan is just this naturally healthier thing. And in a small way, yes, but not necessarily when it leads to obesity and to the same diseases that we talk about um, in mainstream diets. In, at the beginning of your book, um, I really liked the list of the 10 dietary mistakes that people make, including vegans. <laughs> and I wondered if you could talk a little bit to, the, to some of those and how to, how to avoid them, give people some advice. And inspiration well, right before Christmas. <laughs> yeah, I know. You know I, Christmas is a hard time, and I think that, that people sort of just sort of let go of all of the, the possibilities of good habits. And there's a couple of recipes in the book that um, I make for my holiday dinner. Um, there's a stuffed baked tofu in there that's a perfectly festive food. But some of the mistakes that people make, let's, let's go back to that. I, I think a big one is this processed food thing that we talk about. So eating processed foods 
Um, there's nothing nutritious about a lot of these foods. You know, they are just imitations of already unhealthy foods, and they imitate the least healthy components of them. All right. So, and then, and this sort of leads into another one of the mistakes we talk about is the fact that eating too much protein is bad. We have an emphasis in this country on getting enough protein that goes back to a time again when we didn't get enough calories. Period. The World Health Organization identifies the only populations on the planet that don't get enough protein are populations that don't get enough calories. The rest of us get it so easily it's ridiculous that we spend as much energy focusing on it as we do. Mm -hmm. And the excess protein, even vegan protein, a vegan protein doesn't have the same impact that, say, dairy does. But if you're focusing on, like, vegan sausage and you're getting 45% of your calories from that kind of protein, you do see some problems, and not to mention the excess calories, the excess fat. Um, cholesterol is bad of any kind, so staying away from cholesterol is, is, is a good idea. Your body manufactures all the cholesterol that you need. Um, you don't need to worry about it, let alone think about it. Um, you know, this isn't really one of part of that list, but I, I think one of the things that people do when they're trying to lose weight, and you'll see this a lot during the holidays, is, is people try to do this starvation dieting, and it was one of my big problems for a long time. So, like, I would do this starvation thing leading up to the Thanksgiving or Christmas holiday so that I could eat more that day or so that it, I wouldn't gain weight that day. Well, when you deprive your body of that much food, what eventually happens is the hunger mechanism, which is the one that's kept us alive all these millennia, is going to win out you are going to eat one way or another so take a starving body and put it in front of this big buffet and say okay just eat normal portions and it doesn't happen right so you've got to fuel the body all the time to keep the hunger mechanism in check and doing it with low fat whole foods uh, plant-based foods is a great way to do it because that the high fiber foods that we talk about eating really really do go a long way towards managing hunger so you get up in the morning on Thanksgiving Day or Christmas Day and, and you, you get a good high fiber plant based breakfast in you, you do the same thing at lunch, you're not going to overeat when it comes to that big meal later in the day because you've got this fiber in there that's keeping you in check and saying, okay, we're doing okay, we're not in starvation mode, we don't have to worry about it. We can eat normally and enjoy ourselves and, and then go forward from there. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And what, one of the things that I wondered if you could talk about is, um, you know, it is a different taste. If you're cooking without oil or, you know, it is a taste that you have to get used to. So do you have any advice for people who, you know, really want to start, help, like, try, give it a good try either now or after Christmas? <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and, you know, do you have some, some tips for people of what they could try, what, you know, what works? Yeah, I, I, I do think that you have to, to do one thing. You, you have to downregulate your taste buds at some point. And the best way, like sugar is a good example of this. At some point, you're going to have to say, I'm putting sugar aside and taking processed sugar out of my diet. And I'm going to go the two or three weeks that it takes for me to get used to not having sugar. What you find is when you go back to eat um, naturally sweet foods, like when you go to eat pineapple after you've given up sugar, pineapple tastes sweet enough on its own. Okay, so that's what we call the down regulation of the taste buds. You come to appreciate the natural sugars in foods all the more. The same thing kind of happens with fatty foods and things like that, is that you get them out of the diet. And again, it's a kind of a cold turkey thing. You just have to do it. Um, and you might not like food for the first two or three or four or five days, but eventually what you start to notice is you're tasting foods differently, your taste buds are regulated to what's going on, and then when you go back to eating some of those foods that you've not been eating, like fat and sugar, they fat sugar tastes too sweet, and then fat oils taste greasy. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm, so those yeah. are, those are it's, 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 the body will adjust to a new way of eating, and eventually you don't even like the taste of sugar and you don't like the taste of fatty foods. My body doesn't deal well with them. Uh, I, you know, I've gone long enough that there's only so much of that stuff that I can put in me and, and I can tell that I'm not happy. So that's a, that's a couple of things that you do. In the meantime, you know, you see some of the recipes like this in the book. Um, I eat a, a, a delicious vegan ice cream 
uh, made with bananas and a little bit of stevia and maybe a little bit of date syrup that um, are it's sweet, it's creamy, it's rich tasting, um, it's a great treat, and it's not full of fat and excess calories that I don't need. It's made from a nu nutrient dense food. So I've found other things that I like. I can still enjoy an ice cream treat. I have a, a recipe for a fig bar, and they're like, I used to love fig newton, so I have my own version of them. It's a whole grain version of it. And, you know, I've fed these to people, not even said, okay, here's a healthy treat for you to try. And they're like, like oh, my God, these are really good. You know, so it's, it's, it's a lot easier than I think people think. I think it's just a matter of letting go of the emotional attachment we have to the, the way that we've eaten for a long, long time. Some people do it really easily, and some people really struggle with it. So a lot of it's dealing with the, the head trip that you go through that makes you think, oh, I don't want to do this. Yeah, I have to admit I'm one of those people because <laughs> I have you're, so You're not been alone. Saying, i got to get the fat out. i got to get the fat, you know, low fat, high fiber. And we've really struggled. I mean, we've tried over the last 30 days to do it, and I have been almost embarrassed how much I've struggled with it because, you know, I'll taste something and I'll be like, oh, I'll just put some more salt on it or put some brags on it. And, you know, I'm, it's almost like I, I just can't get to that, that, that yeah. bottom level. I mean, I, yeah, I definitely, yeah. and that thing I think is, like you said, a little bit of emotional. And also, you know, I also wonder, you know, how much time do you really have to give it? Because I know you mentioned maybe two or three weeks. But we've been really struggling here on how to really put it in practice and also learn the right new recipes because we've gotten a little lazy and then I get lazy and I just go back yeah. and make those other dishes <laughs> that I know. Yeah, that might. I mean, I think it, it helps when you're exploring new recipes and you might yeah. find you don't like this or that recipe, but you keep trying and eventually you, you find things that you do like. So I make, for example, um, pesto is one of the dishes I make, and I make it with white beans in the cookbook, mm -hmm. and white beans and basil and garlic and, and the salt and everything. You you really don't notice the difference between this pesto, pesto and a traditional pesto, except that mine isn't as oily. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't get the aftermath of, of how that feels to eat that oily pesto, and it's got a lot of flavor. So what you might need to do is find, find recipes that are full of flavor on their own without adding fat to them, and then see how your your taste buds respond to that. Um, that's pretty good advice. Because yeah, I'm a flavor girl. I mean, I'm not. I love spices. I love all that dimension. So sometimes yeah. I've been I've been going down. I'm like, oh, I'm going down. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a flavor guy. I'm with you. I want food. When I went to the wellness forum in 2006, I took my personal chef service with me. And one of the things that I said was, I said my customers aren't going to put up with me, you know, changing these recipes to this crazy healthiness stuff. And Dr. Popper was like, well, just take the oil out of your recipes first. Let's do that and see what happens. You know, not one of my customers noticed. Not one of my – I had one customer say to me, you know, your food's been tasting less greasy lately. Uh -huh. So for the most part, people didn't notice because we find other ways to season food. Herbs and spices do a really good job. That's what I like about pestos is they're full-flavored foods. So I look for those kinds of recipes, and, and that's what I like to eat, and that's what I look for in my foods. Now I'm getting a little bit better. Like you will find me from on occasion eating a plain baked potato with a little bit of salt and pepper on it and being okay with that. And that, that wasn't me five years ago. Mm -hmm. So, again, it's part of that down regulation and getting used to simple foods, but also learning to enjoy flavorful foods in a different way. Absolutely. I think one of the hardest things for me is that, um, you know, I, I definitely know what you're saying about give it a couple of weeks and, and, and your cha tastes change because actually usually once a year I go on a meditation sit for 10 days and the food there is very clean, like very really low oil, really very clean, healthy uh, vegan food and um, I come home and I just feel fantastic and I you know I okay I'm gonna keep this up and I usually do for about two or three months and then I start to slowly get the bring the oil back in and, and I just find it yeah. hard to stick to it so I don't know if you have do you have any um, do you have any kind of uh, tips for people who who are sort of halfway there but uh, you know when you start to slip what's what do you do well you know if, if we're talking about the emotional attachment for food I think I the think first that thing is, I talk yeah. about is is getting is is putting yourself on a path with a whole new set of recipes I think that's one 
So getting the new recipe habit in place is one. But then dealing with the emotional side of it is you have to start having conversations with yourself about what we call your default future. So what is your future like if you continue to eat in an unhealthy way? And, and what's down the road for you? So for me, for example, in my family, we see a lot of, of diseases from bad diet. And I've seen them. I've seen them uh, everywhere in my family. The diabetes, the cancer, the heart disease, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, is, is, is predominant um, because of the way that we eat as a family. And I've decided that I don't want to live that future. So in a way, it's, it's starting to have a grown-up conversation with yourself and, and letting the grown-up and you be in charge and say, okay, I can make this choice. I can choose to eat this way, but then what does my future look like if I don't? Yeah, right. taking full and responsibility for what you're eating. It is eating. taking full yeah. responsibility. And then also accepting the fact that these cravings are going to happen. So when you have a craving, you have to sort of stop yourself. Like it becomes an automatic reflex. If I'm in the grocery store aisle where potato chips are, it used to be an automatic reflex that if I walked by that bag of chips, my hand reaches up and it's in the cart before I've ever had a chance to stop and think about it. So what you have to start learning how to do is to stop yourself before you let yourself do that action and then have a conversation, do I really want it, one, you know, two, is it really helping me to achieve whatever goals it is I'm trying to achieve? And if it isn't, is this worth it? Okay, yeah. so you'll find more and more that the more you do this, then the more you start to make the, the, the better, healthier decisions because, you know, you, you've learned to change those thinking processes uh, in the brain. Yeah, that's a good point. But you know what I find is kind of interesting, and I don't know if there's anyone else out there like me, that when I think about my meals, I do pretty good with my meals. But when I want that snack, when I want that in-between meal, especially since I'm used to the, you know, potato chips, I have to admit, um, you know, I'm used to those types of things, sometimes I struggle because, I mean, I'll get some kale chips and, you know, try to keep some of those around, especially at the, the rate that kale chips come at. Um we've struggled with what do we keep on the shelf for that nibble moment or sometimes for those bad habits. I mean, is it just I got we got to get rid of those bad habits or yeah. are there really good snacks to replace in that? Well, we, uh, we, we teach people to do what we call to uh, sanitize your kitchen in your house, actually. So mm -hmm. if you come into my house, you don't find potato chips, you don't find beer, you don't find any of those things that easily tempt me. My last unhealthy thing that's kind of a whole food unhealthy thing that I got rid of is I can't keep peanut butter in the house because I'll sit and eat it by the spoonful. So I got it out of the house. So when I want something to eat, I have only healthy choices to choose from. And in the beginning, I used to kick and scream and lay on the floor and go, ah, I hate this. But, you know, what I found is now I, I find myself, so I keep frozen bananas. If you, you like ice cream. Yeah, you keep Guys, frozen bananas. Yep. I keep the frozen bananas in there, and I make that first. It takes me five minutes to make this little frozen banana ice cream treat. Okay. It's good. It's creamy. It tastes good. It does the job. Okay. Sometimes just fresh fruit will do the job. Like I love grapes, and I can sit and eat pounds of grapes. So I don't keep that many in the house, but it does the job too. So finding little things like that, there are plenty of healthy choices out there um, that also taste good. And once you downregulate those taste buds, you get sort of used to having like a fresh, a fresh ripe pear when it's in season tastes better than anything else that you you've, you've ever had, right? Mm -hmm. So it's just a matter of sort of you know getting yourself set up for those new habits. You know what I think is really interesting about this conversation is that uh, both I well I think both you and I, Stephanie, are vegans for strictly ethical, or we started, became vegans for ethical reasons, right? I think. Um, I started healthy and then switched over, but okay. I know where you're going. I'm, so I'm with you on it. I'm, I'm just thinking, ahead. you know, I, 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 the vegans that I know who have done this for health reasons okay. are way better at sticking to this stuff. And it's just funny because yeah. to me, like, uh, the, it, when I went vegan, there was no going back to any of those foods that I felt harmed other beings, you know. Um, but it's really interesting listening to what you're saying because really th this is more about extending it to yourself and caring for yourself and, and cutting out those foods that, that um, cause well, our, ourselves harm. If you think about this from a, a, a veganism perspective, all right, if you think about 
um, the movement and and what's important about the movement. Now, now you know, I I I think that eating a vegan diet makes sense for me. I think it, it makes sense for a lot of people. I think it makes sense for our environment, for our planet. But if I don't set a good example of veganism. Um, all I'm doing is fueling the argument against veganism as a movement. In other words, the unhealthy vegan does nothing to move this, this argument forward because you become an example for those who would say that uh, veganism is unhealthy. Yeah. Right? No, I totally so, agree with you. Yeah. And, and so you've given yourself, and what we've just done in this conversation is to give ourselves another part of the conversation to have with ourselves. Mm -hmm. And to with our family, mm -hmm. with others around us, that says, "Here's part of my fuel. I mm -hmm. want to be a good example of veganism um, as I go forward in the planet." Yeah, and definitely. To do so, I got to be healthy. Yeah, you're getting that, us in shape. <laughs> I'm doing well, it. Well, we're not that <laughs> bad, honestly. <laughs> That's so funny. It's like we're we're. To get, a little pep talk here. Thanks, thanks, Chef Dell. <laughs> I, I, you know what? I get my my pep talk too. I've got two trainers. I work out four days a week with trainers uh, now, and which has been really good for me. But I, I get lots of pep talks from them. So you, you're, <laughs> you're, you're, you're getting your turn tonight. We appreciate Glad to do it. So yeah. I was wondering, um, because we are heading into this time of year that's, uh, that people tend to eat richer foods, if you could talk, maybe uh, recommend a couple of recipes maybe from your book or other places that um, – um, you know that will holiday type recipes that people will could use instead of something maybe richer that would be on their table but they won't feel like they're missing out you know I think that you might find that you have um, a favorite dish that isn't on isn't healthy so and, and I say this because it used to be that I would I would go to the table and there would be this pile of unhealthy foods and some of it I would eat just because it was there so, you know, things that I don't really have to have on my plate, um, let's say mashed potatoes. I can probably skip the mashed potatoes or if I don't have a healthier version. So I look for the maybe the one really unhealthy dish that I want to have and I'll have that. Like it might be a piece of a vegan chocolate cake. All right, so I, I might be saving up for that. And then everything else I'll have will be the healthier foods that I like. So... I had, for example, a stuffed baked squash for Thanksgiving. It had wild rice. Uh, it had <clears throat> it had dried cranberries and toasted pecans, and some good herbs and seasonings in, a, in an acorn squash. And it was delicious. I made a, a rich mushroom gravy that makes you not even miss the the fattening chicken based gravy that you know your your aunt makes. Um, and then I have things like in the cookbook. There's that mushroom gravy. There's my stuffed baked tofu. I, I think I call it Dell Stuffed Beast. It's uh, tofu with cornbread stuffing. I would eat stuffing all day long with mushroom gravy if there was nothing else on the planet. I'd be a perfectly happy guy to do that, <laughs> right? So I would have that. Those are a couple of my favorites. There's a Brussels sprout recipe in there um, in the cookbook that I absolutely love. And then any of the soups. So there's the uh, Creole corn chowder. Um, is great in any kind of a meal, and there's the smoky black bean bisque if you like that kind of a dish, or there's a chilled sweet potato bisque It's also really good. So it's kind of, I think people have different traditions, and I think what you have to do is sort of pick your cooking or your health traditions and then find healthier versions of the foods that match those. But those are some of the things that speak to me. Like I love Brussels sprouts. I will eat them any way that you give them to me. Right, um, except raw, but I mean, I love them. Um, I love cornbread stuffing, so give me the the fat free cornbread stuffing. I'm a happy, happy guy. Um, give me some of my banana ice cream, the chocolate banana ice cream for dessert, and I'm I'm there. I won't complain. I'm I'm going to live fully and and feel like I've done very well. Well, that's inspiring. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Stephanie, go ahead. Oh, and I was just going to say, I have to admit, I've tried your cauliflower puree. All right. I really, really like that for thickening Isn't that good? recipes. And it really is. And it's, it's almost like when I looked at it, I was like, oh, how come I never thought of that before? It was such a classic thing because, you know, and cauliflower is an easy thing to keep. It's an easy thing to keep in your fridge. 
you know, we all, you know, yeah. it's not one of those, you know, vegetables that kind of like are more, more perishable. And I just love it for thickening up soups and for sauces and things like that. So I, I just think that's such a great thing that people should think about when they're thickening up sauces. Yeah, it makes a great sauce, and you can use it in any kind of dish where you would normally want that creaminess, and it does well. You'll see in the book, salad dressings, I make ranch dressing with it, and, and all kinds of salad dressings and sauces and things like that. It it really is good, and it's amazing, even by itself, if you just eat pureed cauliflower with a little bit of salt and pepper, it's good by itself just like that. So put that on a baked potato, and you've got something very happening going on there. Oh, I haven't thought about that. I'll have to try that. We'll, we'll give that one a try because I'm I really I got really excited when I, I discovered that in your book. <laughs> yeah, you'll see it more. You see it in the um, the Forks Over Knives cookbook. Um, there's a, a cauliflower bechamel that's used mm -hmm. to make a spinach and sweet potato lasagna. It's amazing. So you know, it it really does a lot. And it has a lot of versatility to it. Perfect. So um, I was wondering if um, we're almost at, well, we're at 6 o'clock, but I, was wondering, I want to get one more question in there. One of the things no, no I problem. noticed <laughs> one of the things I noticed about going through the book is that the, the recipes are very simple, uh, very um, easy to follow, and I think that's a really great thing, especially for people who this type of cooking is really new to. So I was wondering mm -hmm. if that was something you did intentionally or if that's kind of your style or, or if you could talk a little bit about that. It really is more my style than not, but it's funny because for every person that says to me the recipes look really easy, I have one that says these are really hard. So you, oh. you, you run into people who say if it has more than five ingredients, they're not going to do it, even if three of those ingredients are spices that take 30 seconds to measure. Um, so I tend to cook pretty straightforward. I've been teaching cooking classes for um, many years now, and I think it just comes from that, that people want straightforward foods that, that don't take all day to get on the table, and I don't think good food has to be an all-day process. Um, I, I think it's just sort of the style that I've developed as a result of teaching and of, of, you know, I hate to say it, when I get home at night and it's often a 12-hour day, I'm not going to spend an hour and a half in the kitchen. So dinner has to come together pretty quickly, um, or it's not going to happen, and it's back to peanut butter sandwiches. <laughs> Well, I like that. I mean, I think it's a. It, I think that's a really accessible thing for most people because, uh, face it, a lot of us are the same, right? We come home from a busy day, and it's great to have some recipes that aren't too intimidating to get something healthy on the table, and that's something that tastes really great. So, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. The modern world. <laughs> Stephanie, did you have anything else? No, I'm pretty good. I don't know if we want to just. I don't know, if Chef. Del, if you want to give us a little bit about, you know, what's next and what else is on the horizon for you, just to, you know, um, let our um, viewers know. I would <laughs> like not to write a cookbook for the next six months. Um, <laughs> I, I think that because of the way that I teach that I always have that going on in my head. I, I hate to say it, uh, as I say that, I'm actually writing uh, recipes for another book that Forks Over Knives is doing. Uh, it's a book about transitioning, so it's a 30-day kind of, of challenge to or, or book that helps people to, to go from wherever they're at to a healthy plant-based way of eating, and I'm doing the recipes for that book. Um, so I'm, I'm actually in the middle of that. That'll be um, out sometime in the spring, I think. Um, and then I'm going to take a break from writing recipes and then spend some time promoting and traveling. I do a lot of um, teaching and public speaking, and I really, really like it, so I look forward to doing more of that. My company, the Wellness Forum Foods, is coming out with a line of sauces. We're produce we've been working on a line of um, healthy, uh, oil-free sauces and salad dressings, so those are coming out hopefully in January. Um, so I'll be working to promote those and get those out into the world, and then um, we'll see. Uh, maybe some downtime, vacation. <laughs> oh, Sounds like yeah. you deserve it. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Say it louder. <laughs> and let us know when those sauces um, come out, because we'd love to share them with everyone. I'm always, I'm a big sauce. Person, I will. So. Yeah, we we got a barbecue sauce, a stir fry sauce, oh, an, an orange vinaigrette, and a uh, mustard dressing, like a sweet and spicy mustard dressing. So oh, um, I think I'm, they'll be very popular. So, so, so excited. Oh, definitely. <laughs> uh, it's just music to my ears, as they say.
Yay. Well, I think we're a little bit past the time tonight, so maybe we should be wrapping up. I don't know, Chef Del, if you have any final words for anyone who's watching, anyone who's listening um, for tonight, or if we should um, wrap things up now. Uh, food is good. <laughs> Healthy food is better. Enjoy it. Embrace it. Go out and eat well. <laughs> Those are great last words. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's been wonderful. Thank you both. It's been fun. Let's do it again. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And thanks for everybody for listening. And um, uh, check out um, Chef Dell's recipes on the Cookbook Club this week. And make them. Share your photos. Share your thoughts. Ask your questions. And we will be taking a break for two weeks for Christmas and New Year's. And then Yay. we'll be back with you in January. Um, we're still going to be doing lots of stuff on the Cookbook Club, but we don't have any dedicated chefs because we thought probably nobody would want to talk to us on Christmas Day. <laughs> <Nah>. <laughs> so um, we'll be back uh, with an, another chef on it, uh, the second week of or January 6th, the week of January 6th. So um, we'll look forward to talking to everybody again then. So thanks again, Sh um, Chef Dell. I keep wanting to call you Dell, Chef Dell. <laughs> Either way, thank you, and I look forward to seeing you guys again. Great.